Welcome back. Thanks for tuning in. This is Steve McGrath. And in this week's episode, I'm pleased to bring you my conversation with Logan Paulson. Now, Logan spent a decade in the NFL, most of which with the Washington, formerly Redskins. He clawed his way in as an undrafted rookie free agent, but he spent the last five years of his career with five different teams. That's a lot of moving, learning new faces, new playbooks. And he took the time to break down what it was like clawing his way in and grinding it out to have that long career and everything in between. Of course, Washington has been in the news for their team over this offseason, so we hit on all of that as well. And now, without any further ado, here is Logan Paulson and his NFL journey. And now I am pleased to be joined by Logan Paulson, a man with what, nine years NFL experience under your belt? Nine years. Uh, I think Nine accredited, 10 active. So it gets a little fuzzy there, but I'm going to say 10 just to be, just because I feel like I earned it. I, I think you did. I, I mean, I know that this might sound like a, a kind of a stupid question, but like, do you ever think like, I made it a decade in the NFL. The average career is like three years if you're lucky. How did I make it a decade? Yeah, absolutely. That's something I think about all the time. Uh, you know, I don't know how much you know about my playing career, but I was an undrafted free agent out of UCLA to the Washington football team. And you know, I had no expectations of actually making the roster. You know, like midway through training camp, I thought I might make practice squad. And uh, just kind of the stars aligned, you know, Coach Shanahan, uh, Mike Shanahan um, kind of told me in my interview for the, like when I made the roster kind of, he was like, you know, you just had something and we, we wanted to take a chance on you. And so, you know, I'll forever be grateful to the Shanahans for that opportunity. And yeah, so then every year after that, I was kind of like, oh, well, you know, I made it one, but I'm probably going to get cut next year. And it just kind of turned into this really amazing journey, you know, and I look back on it now and it's with a, with a lot of disbelief, you know, cause it was, it, it definitely exceeded any expectation that I had in my wildest dream. So. Oh, and trust me, I, I knew that you were an undrafted rookie free agent, which is one of the big reasons why I want to ask that is because it's just, I don't know what the actual percentage is, but it, it feels like it's a 3% chance of making it. Yeah, it, it wasn't very high even then, you know, like now I think uh, I think it's gotten more difficult now for undrafted free agents because of the way the offseason structured and like the limited time they have with the coaches and the li limited exposure they have. And especially this season, you know, there might not be any preseason games and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, I, I felt like then it was tough. And uh, thank God Shanahan was a guy who didn't really care about your name and your reputation as much. You know, he cut a couple of draft picks. He cut a couple of high profile uh, veteran free agents that year. And so, you know, I think he, he just saw my my work ethic and my and thought maybe I could be something. And, you know, kudos to him because I didn't see it at the time. So uh, that was awesome. Awesome experience. Awesome to meet him and really respect him. Yeah. Um, you know, I actually had Selvish Capers on seventh round pick the year that Did you really. Yeah. And Selvish lasted a year before he moved on to the Giants. But it's safe to say, I, I mean, when guys that were drafted are getting released before guys that the team, you know, didn't even take that draft. I mean, it says something about being an honest evaluator that you're not playing favorites. No, I think that's right. And I think that's something that's so difficult to do, you know, especially with the profile now of, of some of these draft picks and, you know, the way that the media kind of gets behind guys, like it's, you take some courage to cut a guy that uh, a lot of fans support and a lot of fans are excited about, you know, cause they're not in the room every day. They're not in the building. They don't know what that guy's doing. So, you know, I, I think that's that's something that uh, I always admired about Mike specifically. And then other places I've been, they haven't done that as effectively. But um, I definitely think that's a really important um, skill to have. Absolutely. Now, uh, we kind of jumped right into the Redskins days. I actually wanted to back it up a couple steps before that because I love that you kind of have some adversity dealt to you while you're at UCLA. You know, you – not that I wish anyone to, you know, break something and miss an entire year. but yeah. But between that and just watching the uh, coach Dorrell leave, uh, you know, there's an interim coach for her game before the new Heisel yeah. era begins. Right. Can you just talk about whether it's the coaching change where it's a whole, uh, I don't necessarily know how different the scheme was from the coaches from the coaching change, but between that and just dealing with the adversity of having to rehab an injury and missing a year, how, how did you build that thick skin through college? Well, I think, you know, like in college, I had nine different position coaches. I had five different offensive coordinators. I had two different head coaches. And, 
you know, at the time you're kind of, you're cursing under your breath because it doesn't let you, it doesn't give you an opportunity to really get your legs under you. Every year you're learning a new yeah. scheme, you're learning new, like a kind of new standard from the new coordinator uh, and from the position coach. Also, you're getting guys leaving in the middle of the season and stuff like that. But, you know, even at, at the time, I might not have been able to see it. And at the time, I didn't really care because I thought I'm having a great time playing college football. I don't really care about the NFL. But in retrospect now, you know, you know, a decade later, like that, that, termo, that, that turmoil and that turnover really gave me an opportunity to learn how to learn an offense. And that's something that was so undervalued, I think. You know, everyone always talks about people's athletic ability and their ability to produce uh, kind of dynamic and explosive plays on the field. However, like I've seen guys get cut just because they can't lose, lose, learn the playbook. And that's something that I never experienced, you know, and then obviously the adversity of the injury, like you mentioned um, that at the time, it's hard to see it, but it does teach you a lot about yourself and it teaches you a lot about persevering and kind of dealing with, with tough times. And like, it really shows you, you know, I, and I appreciate those moments you know, I had a really bad injury also when I was in the NFL and I missed the whole year. And it shows you what kind of guy you are and it shows you what's important to you because it, it allows you to kind of strip away football for a little bit and say, like, who do I want to be without the game? And so many people value you because of the game. And so it's it's really kind of a good uh, personality check, good gut check, those, uh, those tough moments. So, I mean, to put it concisely, it, it is adversity and it's a tough time. And I'm sure you had to stay positive throughout that in order to get to the end. So do you just have any words of wisdom for how you were able to actually make it through the other side better? Yeah, I think the big thing was like finding um, like a goal and finding a purpose, you know, like your main purpose of playing football is kind of taken away. But in college, like I was able to like pour myself into my rehab, I was able to gain a little bit of weight, you know, in the weight room, uh, kind of invest myself in my studies at school you know, learn how to like teach and mentor younger athletes. And I think finding those purposes outside of the ones that you expect is really important. Like, I think, you know, we talked a little bit yesterday and how you didn't feel fulfilled with what you were doing prior to this. And this is kind of a passion project for you, but like finding that purpose and that passion, even in something that maybe is a little unconventional, I think is so important. Definitely. Yeah. But the sense of purpose that always, I think is the root core of your, your happiness or dissatisfaction yeah. with something. Right. Um, but, but you said that you wanted to mentor younger athletes. And what I really wanted to ask you, playing tight end, you go to UCLA at a time where Mercedes Lewis is there. Yeah. Did, did him being there have any impact on you wanting to play and possibly learn from him? Or was it? Or am I building this up a little bit too much where maybe you didn't learn all that much from how to play the position? Well, I think it's really cool to go to a school and see a guy who's a first round. Uh, first round draft pick at the position and uh, a Mackey award finalist you know what I mean uh, he wasn't the first tight end selected that year Vernon Davis was but you know he's been in the NFL for almost 15 years now which is kind of unbelievable to think about and so to see kind of that talent like up close and personal like did he prepare the best in college like probably not was he the best student in the game no but just to see that guy and see see what it looks like up close at a very early early point of my career because you know I went to a very small Catholic high school my senior year we only had 20 guys on the football team so you know kind of coming from this small pond to UCLA and seeing like the biggest fish I've ever seen in my life and uh kind of being like okay like that's what I if I'm going to beat him out if I'm going to beat guys like that out I'm going to need to work exceptionally hard and that's that's that was one thing that I took away from that experience with him is like to beat the freaks you got to just outwork everybody so if when you're call it 18 years old, you see that the bar set there, fast yeah. forward five years, you're now in the NFL, Chris Cooley, Fred Davis. Yeah. I mean, I always loved Chris Cooley because he didn't play the conventional tight end spot. It was more of an H back that they, he was yeah. multifaceted. Fred, obviously a very talented receiver from being around those guys. How did you, oh, conceptualize the niche that you could have on the team what, did you try to take anything from their games or how they approach the game yeah I mean I think I think again like having kind of these two monoliths at the position like Cooley was a pro bowler at the position he'd been at the he'd been for, with the team for I think seven years when I arrived six or seven years when I'd arrived and Fred who was also he won the Mackey award in college was a second round draft pick and who was exceptionally talented like I kind of saw from day one like I'm gonna need to do whatever they don't want to do. 
uh, exceptionally well to be able to contribute to this team. So that, you know, looks like special teams, that's blocking, that's goal line, tight end, that short yard and stuff. And so becoming really proficient in those areas. And also, um, you know, going back to like being a student of the game, like that was another thing that I knew I had to, had to, um, had to really embrace was because I knew like if Cooley got hurt, I'd have to play kind of the H back role. And if Fred got hurt, I'd have to play the traditional Y blocking tight end role. And I'd have to be comfortable with both of those positions. So I had to learn two positions and a fullback spot because you're kind of that flex position for those kind of big skill guys on the offense. And uh, that was really cool that the coach was coaches trusted me with those opportunities. And, um, and one of the reasons why was because I just studied, studied exceptionally hard, you know? Yeah. The, you you got to love the versatility of being able to, but I think it goes back to maybe what you said about college learning offenses, you learn the offense, but you're so used to having to learn and relearn and relearn that maybe it was a little bit easier for you than the average athlete to, okay, I can get this role. I can understand that role because I'm so used to having to relearn this stuff. Yeah, I definitely, you know, like I said, like looking back, like it was a blessing to have that opportunity, you know, and it didn't seem like an opportunity at the time, but it definitely was an opportunity to kind of get exposed to different offensive terminology, offensive philosophy, and then you kind of have this great foundation. And then you have like a, a methodology for learning offenses. Like I can't tell you how many times I've been in a room with guys who didn't have any kind of conception of what it meant to study. You know what I mean? And that is something that I had in spades because of my college experience. Yeah. Playing, whether it's the traditional tight end or more of an H back, I, I mean, I think it's, and I'll, I'm sure I'll get crap for this, but I think it's the hardest in the game because you need to be able to catch the ball like a receiver. Maybe if you're not as fast, but you need to be able to have some moves, but you need to have your offense alignment teammates respect you with what you're able to do manhandling people. Yeah. How did you walk the line of trying to make sure that both ends of that spectrum, you were maximizing your potential? Yeah, I think that's something that's like really challenging. And it's been an interesting evolution at the position over the course of the last 10 years. Now, you know, like like when I was first drafted, like uh, a bigger body guy at the position was kind of the standard or the expectation, you know. And then because of that bigger body uh, requirement and the, the need to block in line, like the receiving quality wasn't as high. You know, like Cooley was considered a really good receiving tight end, but he weighed like 260. <clears throat> and now a really good receiving tight end is like, you know, Jordan Reed, who's like 240, you know what I mean? And really can't block at all and is just an outstanding receiver. And I think that that's something that has changed quite a bit. But at the time, you know, it was like just trying to do the best that I could with what I had. You know, I'm not the most fleet of foot guy necessarily. So I just was like, I'd stay after and I'd catch, you know, 200 balls at the backup quarterback, you know, like I'd come in on Monday after the game and we'd go through the whole script of the game and catch every ball that was thrown in that game, you know, and thankfully I had other guys who wanted to work with me, um, at, you know, and were willing to kind of put the time in and which allowed me to be better. But, you know, just, just really, again, it's, I go back, it's just working your craft and taking pride in what you do, you know? For sure. Um, now, now when you think back to high school, when you're playing soccer, track and field, being a multi-sport athlete, do, do you think that that actually helped you be a better football player down the line with learning different skill sets? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think, um, you know, it's like, it's analogous to like school, you know, like you, you don't specialize in education. Uh, you know, you kind of have this diverse portfolio at an early age and it creates this really nice base of intellectual kind of development. And it's the same thing with athletics, right? The more kind of diversity you're exposed to in terms of physical movement, the the better foundation you have. And you can kind of build um, a higher peak with a larger foundation. And, you know, like I'm into, like one of my big hobbies is strength conditioning. And that's something that comes up in the literature all the time is having, uh, exposing young athletes to just different sports um, kind of increases their, uh, their, their kinesthetic awareness in a way that um, is really nice and helps them learn movements later in life really effectively. So I, I do think that that was really critical. You know, at the time I didn't know that I just like playing sports and my dad liked me playing sports. And that was his one big thing was like, you're just going to play a different sport every season. I don't care what the coach says. So, you know, ruffled a couple of feathers with that, but it worked out for me. So. Uh, now j just going deeper in, into your Redskins time, you're, 
you start, of course, with, with Shanahan, and of course, his son Kyle is the offensive coordinator. Yeah. As Jay comes in, you know, Sean McVay gets elevated from quarterback coach to offensive coordinator. Two guys that end up having a lot of success down the line as OC is moving up to head coach. But just thinking about your time with the Washington team, do you, <laughs> we'll get into that. Do you think, or what were your thoughts were about how the team was run? And even just outside of personnel, because I know that RG3 is a whole discussion in and of itself. Right. Um, so what was your question again? Can you just phrase it again one more time? Just when you playing with, with uh, you know, Shanahan versus Sean McVay when they're both calling yeah. as the OC, did you see, you know, maybe anything that would yeah. lead you to believe they'd be successful down the line? Absolutely. I mean, you know, Kyle is, is probably the, the most intelligent football person I've ever been exposed to. You know what I mean? Um, and then – you know, his one kind of Achilles heel when I first met him is that he's a little bit, he's not a great people person. He's not a great natural leader. And then Sean is kind of, he is like a robot when it comes to football. He's, he's very intuitive when it comes to the game. He's very dedicated. He works at it, but he doesn't have Kyle's kind of like natural ability for football, but, but what he lacks in terms of his, and, and that's not to say that he's not an extremely bright guy because he is right. he's very, very smart. Um, he just is not like, one of the best of all you know what I mean he just isn't it's a little different but he what he makes up for in his lack of in that way with Kyle is his leadership he's an outstanding leader he relates really well to people and you could see that from day one like Sean um, one of the things that made him so special is he'd go into any room like you know he'd be down with the cafeteria staff he'd know everybody's name he'd know the cleaning guy's name he'd know the training guys the training room everyone in the training room's name <clears throat> you know and every support staff, the person in HR, the person in accounting. And that was something that I thought that is a guy that it's important to him to be a leader of people. And one of the most important things in my opinion is being able to relate to people and show them they're important. And he was excellent at that, like really spectacular. So like, yeah, immediately you could tell that both those guys were destined for, for great things. It was interesting. Like when I was my third or fourth year, third year, cause Kyle got fired after, after my uh, third year, but I had a conversation with Kyle and said, are you going to be a head coach? Is that your goal next year or two years from now? And he was like, you know, I'm going to wait a little bit because I don't think I'm um, ready yet. My development's not there yet. And I thought that was so insightful of him to be able to characterize himself that way. And now you look at his time in San Francisco and, you know, obviously he found the right time and the right situation for that. Yeah. A stock that's clearly only going up. Uh, yeah. Both of them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And yeah, there's no slide against uh, coach McVay. Uh, but I have to ask because, you know, I, I have family in the, the D.C. area. I, I was certainly very happy to see, you know, RG3 go to the Redskins. With hindsight being what it is, your thoughts on trading a lot of draft capital to get one guy, which then handicaps the team to get better in the future. And, you know, I think the story kind of shows there. It would have been nice to have additional picks. What do you just think about the idea of, of or the cost to get Robert on the team and also how he was then handled because that also seems like it could have been better. Right. Yeah. I think that's, that's a very complicated couple of questions there. <laughs> uh, so like my, my personal, my, no, my personal philosophy on the drafts is that you should never trade up. You should always try to trade back if you can, because like ultimately at the end of the day, like it's very hard to justify um, one guy when two or three would, would, you know, of high caliber players would be really, uh, would be much appreciated to the roster. Um, now at the time, you know, Robert was considered kind of a once in a generation talent. And after his rookie year, I think everyone was really excited about what he had to offer. Um, and it looked like that was going to work out. However, um, I think that he, Robert, you know, got a lot in his life very quickly, you know, at a very young age, he's a second pick overall, like, and I think he was very, um, how to say it, like diplomatically, he's very like cocky and confident. And he, I think going into his second year, he kind of, um, he thought of himself in a way that he thought of himself as having things that he didn't have. He thought of himself as being a pocket passer and he wanted to make that transition and he wasn't ready yet for it. You know, he, he, there's a kind of a classic story that's been circulating around that he, um, you know, he went into Mike Shanahan and wrote like unacceptable on the board and Mike and the defensive coordinator and Kyle were in there and the owners in there. And he had to cut up a plays that 
basically were like, these plays are unacceptable for me to be running. And they were all kind of, you know, different quarterback runs. And so in Kyle's mind, because Robert had the support of the owner, you know, we stopped calling all these kind of quarterback RPO type runs that really, you know, if you look at that film of 2012, like, simplified defenses dramatically like we just knew what defenses were going to run because of robert's ability with his legs they just didn't have an ability to account for him you know what i mean in a way so you'd get cover three you'd get an eight man box maybe even a nine man box and you no know, single high safety and i don't care who you are you can throw against that you know and yeah. um and then as defenses got more complicated and they realized like how to handle what his limited running package and they knew that he wasn't going to run as much anymore um it just became really hard for everyone else on the offense and it became really hard for Robert and um, you know I don't think I appreciated 2012 in terms of the simplicity until I got 2013 where you're getting crazy complicated blitz packages you're getting crazy complicated run stunts you're getting all of these really nuanced responses to uh, NFL responses to our offense you know and I think that um you know, like a little bit of that was Robert kind of thinking he was ahead of the curve a little bit. And it would have been nice if you could have said, hey, you know, I'm going to trust Kyle. I'm going to trust Mike. And, you know, they've been around for a long time. But, you know, you can't fault the guy like the world was at his fingertips. And, you know, Dan Snyder really um, empowered him to do that. I think uh, that's the result you get. You're right. That was a, a lot to ask you. In, in one. <laughs> <laughs> but, um uh, just one, one last piece of, you know, the, the Redskins, and I keep doing it, uh, uh, calling them the Redskins. So, all right, I know that obviously I'm having a tough time adjusting to the lack yeah. of a, a, a name there. With everything that's happened the last few weeks, I mean, did you have any strong feelings about the Washington team name and or anything related to the culture that's also been aired out? Yeah, I mean, yes, I did. So, you know, like I mentioned on the radio the other day that the, um, you know, like we used to have meetings with Bruce Allen where he'd come in and justify the team name to the, to the roster. He'd, you know, it was like a couple of weeks before training camp would start, we'd be reporting. And one of the meetings we'd have was like, this is why the team name is okay. You know, like 95% of, you know, um, Native American groups support us having the name. And, you know, I think a lot of guys felt a little conflicted about it because like obviously the name sounds kind of pejorative you know what I mean and um and I think you know we all felt a little weird about it but then Dan would come in and be like these are the analytics these are the data so I think even then that was you know over that was almost 10 years ago eight years ago now you know like they kind of knew that there was going to be some friction with the name even then there was protest so and I think now with the current political environment like that is something that is just it, it, it took way too long for it to happen you know and I think I understand why hardcore fans are um are upset you know because they grew up with the team but i do think it's time that you know like the red the the washington football team moved in the 21st century in terms of in terms of their name you know and then with yeah. regards to the other with regards to the other stuff uh you know like all that are you talking about the sexual harassment and all that stuff that was coming out of there yeah yeah, it, yeah. and who knows what else you might have seen that wasn't part of what, anything else that was put out there but it seems like it stems from the top and i mean you just by painting the picture of the owner bypassing several levels to give, you know, Robert a certain feeling that's, yeah. that's already not a good sign. So the, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. Any, anything you want to add? Well, I just think it was, um, you know, the NFL, you know, everywhere I've been, it's kind of a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a locker room culture, you know, and you kind of know what that means from playing high school football. It's a lot of guys, a lot of guys hanging out. And I felt like, the, um, the Washington football team, the culture there was exceptionally kind of um, like hyper masculine and locker roomy because the age of a, the team, like it was the oldest team in the NFL when I first arrived there. So you got all these guys who are like in their late thirties playing football. And then all the staff there that hadn't been brought in by Mike had been there for, you know, about 20 years. So they kind of lived in a time and were coming from a time where it was very um, kind of like mad men to, to give an example, very kind of, patriarchal in terms of uh how things were run and I think a lot of that kind of was never checked because of some of the leadership decisions and I think this is kind of the the result of some of that yeah I I think that that's probably a very fair analysis of it um what 
seems to not be talked about is the the massive branding opportunity that Washington now has to yeah. they can find a way to to take the the first you know eighty years hundred years of their existence and find a way to always hold that in high regard and let the old time fans respect it and, and revere it while turning the page and make billions of dollars rebranding in a way that everyone will be happy that they finally bit the bullet. It just seems like it, there's a huge chance for them to come out on top of this, but I don't know if anyone has any faith that they'll actually do it the right way. Yeah, I was, I think that's a really good point. Like, do you trust the leadership to, to make a right, uh, make a good decision? Like I've been hearing some of the names being thrown around and they're all very kind of cookie cutter vanilla, like make it mean something, make it, make it important. Like you said, make it, kind of put your stamp on this opportunity and I just feel like from what I've heard in the direction they're going with the name it's just not they're, it's not going to happen you know what I mean but that's I think that's you know um, me being in the area for about 10 years now like you don't have a lot of faith in uh, in the ownership uh, for the Washington football team you know so yeah but I you know you only feel that way because past experience has told you to feel that way <laughs> and that's why there's a lot of people there with you uh myself yeah. as a you know very far outsider excluded uh, included in that yeah um, absolutely you know, just, so just moving past this a little bit before we get to the, the second half of your career you have good years at playing in washington it happened to come though while the team was going through tougher times you know particularly yeah. as you know the the second half of uh, 2013 really went south do you have – how do you deal with, like, you know what, I'm finally breaking through as a player. I, I was a long shot, and year after year, yeah. I keep beating the odds to make it. Oh, I'm finally getting touchdowns, getting, you know, 300-yard seasons. Yeah. But it's coming while the team itself is really suffering. I, how did you sort of balance the, the, the two different levels of success? Well, I think this is going to sound maybe a little crass, but, like, you know, in the NFL, like – the team doesn't really care about you that much, you know, like they care about the team and they care about revenue and they care about wins. Right. And, you know, like their, their level of loyalty to the player is not very high. And I think that um, I kind of just was like, I need to do the best I possibly can because there is a good chance that when Mike gets fired, I will no longer be here. So I need to make sure that despite all this stuff that's going on, like my best foot is going to be forward because each game in the NFL is an interview, right? And if whatever reason the interview isn't going well, like you're going to be out of the league. And so I just kind of kept that in my mind during that period and it served me well. Um, but, you know, like, like that was all I could do. Like it was just kind of ignore the team, ignore the noise and just focus on the task and just try to put my best foot forward. So, you know, unfortunately, in 2015, you do end up hurt, as you said earlier. Yeah. And again, you're no stranger to having to deal with an injury and battle yeah. back. But the fact that that also coincides with your end uh, of your, your Washington tenure, how did you because this, this ultimately puts you on a, a five year, five different geographic location run. Yeah. You're already no stranger to learning new terminology, and new offenses. So at least that might have been easier for you than some, but the added now layer of having to move your family across the country multiple times year after year. Yeah. How did just you as a person, you know, function knowing all this uncertainty and change? Yeah, that was extremely difficult. Like I went, so I got, so I did my year on IR, which is really, it was hard, but it was nice to be home with the family. My son was like a year and a half or two years old. So it was really nice to be spending a lot of time with him. And then my wife was pregnant. And so then the, or we got my wife got pregnant and I got cut in Washington and I went and to Chicago. And during that time period, we didn't move because my wife's, all my wife's doctors were here. So I was flying home on the off days. It's like a hour and a half flight, you know, for 12 hours. And I'd fly back or she'd fly up. And I thought I was going to miss the pregnancy or miss the birth the whole time. So that was terrible. You know what I mean? And so you're kind of navigating this really difficult thing at home while trying to play well, you know, and um, so that was really tough. And then I played pretty good. Like I, the coach, the tight end coach there was, was, was a good guy and really helped me out. And I learned a lot from him and we're still really good friends to this day. And I played well. I thought, you know, now's an opportunity I can get stick on somewhere. It's not going to be with Chicago, but maybe I'll have an opportunity to get a one or two year deal someplace, make a little bit of money and, and move the family and feel pretty good about it. And so I got a call from San Francisco and Kyle. And I went out and I was like, oh, this is great. Kyle knows me. I'm going to have an opportunity to 
be on the team. My wife's family, uh, her mom and dad live out there. So we moved everybody out there. And then, you know, the best laid plans kind of always go awry, but I got cut three times, cut and re-signed three times in that season. So like I had to move my family back and then I got re-signed and then, you know, like it was just this terrible experience. Um, you know, I was, it, and it was really stressful, I think for the, for everybody. But again, like the NFL doesn't care about that. They only care about, you know, what you're putting out on the field. So you just kind of kind of compartmentalize these different things in your life, learn the offense, play as hard as you can and try to get enough good film that it works for you, you know? And after that season, I really thought I might've been done. Like I just, I didn't play a lot. I played well when I did play, but didn't play a lot. And I was kind of doing the free agency, like visiting with teams and, I couldn't get on anywhere. And then I got a call from Atlanta and went there and I thought I played really well, but I had a really bad knee injury the second half of the year. So I wasn't playing as much and not as well because I had like a grade two MCL tear and they were, I didn't realize this, but they kind of held that against me in free agency the next time. And uh, they brought in another guy that the new coaching staff liked a lot. So then I ended up in Houston and it just, it's been a little bit of a whirlwind and, you know, because of the San Francisco thing, I didn't move my family down to Atlanta. So, it was, uh, you know, I love football and I love the game, but it got really difficult to keep that love and keep that passion when it's taking so much from you, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. The, the business side of it just completely grinds your soul down. Yeah, that's right. That's a good, that's a great way to put it. That's a great way to put it. I like, like, I, like I was in Houston and I, I knew I was only going to be there for about eight weeks because of the way the roster was structured. And I just was like, when I got cut, it was like the biggest relief. Like, I was like, I'm just going to go home now and just be with my family. And, and I never, never in my life, you know, having kind of clawed my way in, thought I would just be so happy to be out of it, you know? And then later that year, I got a call from Oakland and I ended up turning it down because I just was like, I cannot do another staying in a hotel. That's the other thing. Like this whole time I'm living in a hotel, I'm living in like a really shitty Airbnb you know what I mean? Like in San Francisco, I lived in an Airbnb where like it was a single family home and 15 other people lived there and they had like subdivided rooms and stuff. Oh, and man. it was just, it was a nightmare, you know? And um, yeah, so it's sucking your, like crushing your soul is like exactly how I felt the day <laughs> I got cut in Houston. I just was like, I am over it. But yeah. So, so I mean, it, not to insinuate that you regret any of it or would do it differently, but uh, you know, of that the four different locations, did you have a spot that like you did like the best or was particularly better than you may have thought? So I think I enjoyed my time everywhere, you know, like really like San Francisco, like great culture, great team, great guys. Like obviously the, the, the effect it had on my personal life was really challenging. Chicago was great. Like the team was not very good. That was when John Fox was there and they were getting ready to do a full, like, you know, front office and coaching staff overhaul but great dudes, great, you know, like it was really fun. Like that was kind of looming over that experience. Everyone knew they were going to get fired. So that was a little awkward. And then going to Atlanta was great. Like the culture there is really like a lot of fun. Like, you know, it's very Seattle-ish. Like they play a lot of games and meetings, like, and they really kind of emphasize like the brotherhood of football. And in a way, like when I got cut from that team, because I had so much fun there, um, it was it hurt me like even more you know what I mean because we talked about mentoring young guys and stuff and I really poured myself into that and when I was there and um, you know like you know coach Dan Quinn was like it, I've never felt so emotional when I had to cut a player and I had never been so emotional when I got cut because I had felt like this really strong connection to the organization you know and then I kind of was mad at myself for forgetting like the first rule of the NFL like no one gives a shit about you and so, you know, that was, that was probably the most difficult, but again, like it was difficult because it was so good, you know? And then even my time in Houston, which was by all measures, not very good. Like the guys are really good. The coaching staff was cool. And it was great to see a different kind of perspective on the NFL. Cause that was the kind of Belichickian kind of model, you know, and just to see how that worked and, you know, meet Bill O'Brien, like who's kind of out of his mind, but was a really fun guy to play for because he was so out of his mind. You know what I mean? So, so yeah, I mean, you get calloused, you, you know, your soul gets calloused with <laughs> all, all the, uh, the business side of it being what it is. And, and I mean, it's just a reality for so many guys that play in the NFL. So that part of it, 
when you add on then the extra layer of you've seen you know, five different franchises, how they operate, how, what makes them successful, what you see in good coaches versus bad, good players and bad, good owners and bad owners. Is there an easy way to sort of, you know, sift through all that and be like, okay, this is what makes successful people successful. I think so. I think that if you know, if you got to boil it down, I think it just comes down to like really good leadership, you know, and like there are many different leadership styles and like not, not um, holding people to say like their leadership style is bad or good, but like how they execute their leadership style, if that makes sense. And then, really good leaders are also really good delegators, you know, and it, it's so apparent in a football uh, team because you have the coordinators, right? You have the head coach and you have the coordinators. And if those relationships are good and like they're really strong, then the offense or the defense is really strong because they feel supported and supplemented by the coordinator. And if those coordinators are good, like with Kyle in San Francisco and Kyle in Washington, um, the the position coaches are held to a really high standard and he gets a lot out of them too. And then by extension, they get a lot out of the players. So like that leadership hierarchy, when you come into a building and you kind of feel it out a little bit, it becomes very clear, very quickly, like, like just not to throw anybody in the bus. But when I went to Chicago, like I love the offensive coordinator in Chicago. He was a really good dude. Like we're good friends, but he's not a great leader. And then that matriculates down into the offense. And I've told him that, you know, and, I think that that's something that's so important to kind of keep in mind. Like what is like, it's kind of a little bit of a nebulous thing, like good leadership, but you kind of know it when you see bad leadership. Right. And I think that's kind of what the experience taught me is what bad leadership looked like in, in the majority of cases. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I mean, even if you don't know what to do, knowing what not to do is also a good way <laughs> yeah. to make sure that you don't fall into some obvious, you know, pitfalls. pitfalls that's right. Rather. Exactly. Um, well, it, so, you know, here we are, you know, off season heading into 2020, uh, where we hope that there'll be a season. We know that right. there will be a preseason, but what are you doing today? How are you organizing your thoughts for what you want, you know, moving forward in life? Yeah. So I'm, I think for all intents and purposes, I'm kind of retired, you know, from the NFL. Like if something crazy happens and someone called me, I'd, maybe look at it but you know like I'm kind of moving in a different direction I'm just kind of uh, I'm doing some personal training right now I've got some classes at a local ice rink with some um, you know hockey players who are like in middle school and high school and that's been a lot of fun it's been very fulfilling a little bit lower stress I'm home with my kids a lot more which is awesome I've got some uh, you know like sales jobs with like athletic equipment that I'm looking into and um, and then I've got my own kind of project that I'm working on in terms of developing and hopefully patenting a piece of fitness equipment, you know, and so all of those things, like they're, you know, a lot of different pots, but I do feel like we talked about having a purpose and feeling fulfilled at the top of the show. And I feel like right now, that's how I feel. I feel like I'm busy and I feel like everything is being productive and it's not bringing in a ton of revenue, but like uh, my quality of life is, is very high right now. And hopefully some of those opportunities develop and they become big things, you know, like kind of like you in this show. It's a big thing, right? Followed your passion. Maybe not a big thing yet, but we're hoping. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of what I'm doing. And it's just, and right now, you know, I'm kind of trying to prioritize my family and my wife and my kids because I have been away a lot, you know, so. Well, man, you are now a rookie again at yes. doing something new. So as you saw, you know, sometimes it takes a couple of years to, you know, work through the, the fundamentals and be able to level yourself up where you, I'm sure what you're doing now, you'll be able to scale, do bigger, you know, don't want to say better things and belittle what you're doing now, but, you know, find a way to yes, see that right. growth continue. Yeah, that's right. I think that's a really good, uh, I like the wor wordage, like the verbiage there. You know, you're a rookie again, so you got to kind of uh, navigate you know, like, like the first time I navigated an NFL locker room, like that was a different experience, learned an NFL playbook, like it was a learning experience and it was difficult. And that's kind of how this feels. And I love the way that you, you phrase that. So appreciate that. All right. Well, Logan, to wrap this up, I have this little thing called the gauntlet. It's just a couple quick hitter questions. I need your knee jerk okay. answer on. Okay. What's most important? Is it having the number one offense or number one defense? Oh my gosh. In today's NFL, number one offense. All right. Now, do you have a favorite football memory? But if it's any easier, do you have a favorite touchdown? Oh, my gosh, yeah. So when I was uh, in Washington, 
Um, I caught a ball uh, in the playoff game against Seattle, and we and it was to put us up fourteen and zero. And everyone in the stadium went crazy. And like, I don't remember all of my touchdowns. I don't remember all of my catches. Some guys are really good about that, but that just stuck out to me. That moment of thinking, like, man, we are going to go to the Super Bowl this year. And then obviously it didn't work out that way. But that moment uh, just rang so clearly for me, you know. So yeah, that's awesome. Now, did you have a pregame ritual that you'd stick to? Oh, yeah, I was very like, it's not like a sexy pregame ritual, but very mechanical in my approach. Like, I ate at this time, I got to the stadium at this time, I did this kind of warm up, I got this, you know what I mean? And it was it had to be the kind of the same every time. And I tried to get out of it. But I always found myself falling back into the same routine, you know, and it's, and I always my wife's like, what are you doing? You're just like, it doesn't mean anything. But like, it just worked for me at the time. So we're creatures of habit. <laughs> That's right. Now, what's most important? Is it the players? Or is it the scheme? Oh, um, that's a really interesting question. And like, I know these are supposed to be quick answers, but I'm gonna give you a little bit longer answer. Like well, there's I had no a, right or wrong to it. So I mean, yeah, the floor is yours. yeah I, I had, I had an interesting conversation with Sean McVay, who he had talked to an older coach. I don't remember his name now. This was a conversation I had about five years ago. And he said, there's only five guys on every team that can play at a high level on any team in the NFL. And the, the longer I was around the NFL, the more I saw that to be true. Right. There's only a couple guys, like a handful of guys on each roster that are good enough to to transcend scheme. So that means that 85 percent of the roster is essentially 85, 90 percent of the roster is essentially there because they fit the scheme. And I always thought that was kind of bullshit. But as I was around more and as I saw my own career, like I realized, like I was a scheme guy, you know, and like other guys were scheme guys. They couldn't play in other schemes. And so I think that is something that is, uh, you know, I want to say the players are more important, but I really think it's, it's probably, and because you, there, it's a symbiotic relationship, chicken or egg type thing. But I do think the scheme is really important to, to help the player be their best. Fair enough. Absolutely right. Now, last one, and I think it's most important, considering that you've overcome injuries, you've overcome the odds to have the career that you've had. I mean, everything you've been able to accomplish, what's the best piece of advice that you'd give to a young athlete? Oh my gosh. Um, I think it would have to be never take anything for granted. Like never take a moment for granted. Like there's, I, I can't tell you how many guys I've seen and I've met and I've played with who were way better than me and they deserve to be on an NFL team just based on physical talent, but they took the opportunity for granted. They didn't show up on time to meetings. They didn't take care of their bodies. They didn't handle their nutrition. They didn't go to workouts. They didn't study their playbook and it doesn't matter how talented you are. If you, if you don't put everything you got into it, it's not going to work. And this is true of anything in life. Like if you don't invest yourself fully, it's not going to become what you want it to be, you know? And so I think that would be it. Just like, make sure you're fully invested, like at, at every stage. That's awesome. Great words to leave it on. Um, Logan, man, thank you so much for taking the time and coming on. I, I, I can't wait to see what the future holds because I'm sure whatever it's going to be, given everything you've been able to do with that mindset, man, it's, it's going to work out great. And I, I hope that it's in the commentating realm. Oh, well, I appreciate that, man. Thank you so much. And really, I, uh, you know, I was a little nervous coming on here, but you've got a great show. You did a great job. It was a pleasure uh, doing this interview. So thank you.